And tonight on PM Express, a conversation about Ghana's debt to GDP ratio, which the Bank of uh, the World Bank is projecting to hit 104 percent by close of year. It's in its latest African Pulse report. How did we get here? Well, the World Bank is largely blaming the Bank of Ghana for delay in introduction of monetary policy measures to deal with worsening economic indicators, especially inflation. Is this a reasonable projection, knowing that our debt-to-GDP ratio six months ago was about 78%? What will cause this drastic change? And what will happen if we finally get there? Let me share with you details of the latest uh, report of the Africa Pulse. And uh, this is how it puts Ghana. So first, debt to GDP ratio by end of year. And we're looking at uh, some African countries. We are comparing Ghana to Eritrea, Sudan, Cape Verde, Mozambique. And if you look at this chart, you will realize that Ghana is number four. On that chart, why do we compare Ghana to South Sudan? It's uh, in, to Sudan. It's not possible because Sudan is a war-torn country. We shouldn't be comparing this. But Ghana is on number four. Now look at this one. The ratio projections from 2022 to 2024. Again, you have from 2017 um, and 2018, which is almost close, 55.50 percent and 57.60 percent come to 2019 and 2020 there's a little difference 62.40 percent and 76.10 percent then in 2021 2022 almost close 77 percent 78.30 percent now look at this projection this is where our conversation is going to center on the um, world bank is projecting that by december 2022 will hit 104.60 percent this means that we're spending over 100 percent in paying our debt now 2023 it projects that it will come down to 99.70 and then in 2024 pick up 101.80 percent probably because of elections now this is according to the world bank um, the, in Ghana, the central bank delayed interest rate hikes until inflation soared from 13.9% in January 2022 to 19.4% in March, followed by a massive depreciation of the city. Now, this is how the currencies um, in some countries have worked. And again, you have South Sudan, you have Sudan, Malawi, and uh, then you have the CFA franc. And we are comparing the city to all these countries. And you realize that Ghana has lost its value. Uh, the city has lost its value to 60%. Compared to other countries, CFA franc has lost it at 13.30. But Ghana lost it at 60%. Look at the city to dollar depreciation. And you have from 2017 to 2022. 2017, it stayed at 4.90%. 2018, 8.39% percent 2019 15.70 percent so it went up a bit in 2019 and then 2020 came down to 3.90 percent look at 2021 four percent and that was marvelous now just look at the gap 2022 we are at 60.00 percent and this is where the projection is coming from so prepared jointly by the staff of International Development Association and the International Monetary Fund. I'm talking about the latest report we're talking about, and it was approved by Marcelo, um, the IMF. Now, it's a joint bank fund debt sustainability analysis. Those of you who say that um, COVID came in to uh, make us a risk of external debt distress, this is the projection in 2019. And even before COVID hit us, it says risk of external debt distress high, overall risk of debt distress high, um, granularity in the risk rating sustainable, application of judgment, no. Okay, so let me explain this further. Fitch downgraded Ghana to CC. What does a CC mean? It means that default is imminent with little prospect for recovery. 
that is what a CC means. And that is where uh, Fitch downgraded us to. So in cases where country's debt is assessed as unsustainable, the IMF is precluded from providing financing unless the member takes steps to restore debt sustainability, including by seeking a debt restructuring from its creditors. And tonight we're focusing on this conversation. You may know that there are negotiations with the IMF. Is this kind of projection going to affect our negotiations with the IMF? Is a debt restructuring on the table? Tonight I've been joined by Dr. Kessie Alato Forsen. He's a ranking member on the Finance Committee of Parliament. I've also been joined by Professor Charles, Professor Eric Osesi, but he's Associate Professor of the University of Ghana. And I'm also, uh, I've also been joined by Dr. Theo Champo, who is a political risk analyst. Let's have a conversation after this break. Welcome back to PM Express. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. I've been joined in the studio by KCL Atoforce and Dr. Atoforce. And I'm grateful Thank that you were able to make it. Thank and you. on Zoom, I've been joined by Professor Eric Asibe, who is an Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Ghana. I've also been joined by Dr. Theo Champo. He's a political risk analyst. I'm grateful, gentlemen, for your time. Let me start with you, Ato. Considering the fact that um, six months ago, um, our debt to GDP ratio was at 78% as against uh, a total debt of 393.4 billion. How did we get here? Uh -huh. um, Aisha, first to start with, I do not believe that six months ago, Ghana's debt to GDP was 78%. I don't believe that. Mm. For a number of reasons. We have constantly made that statement that Ghana's debt to GDP is not properly accounted for in the sense that we have identified what we call hidden debt. A typical example is when you use ESLA revenues for the purposes of collateral and to use it to take a loan. Mm. And we believe that per the nomenclature of the ESLA receivables itself, its corresponding debt should be part of the public debt. The government had consistently decided to ignore us. We believe that the ESLA debt is public debt and should be captured as such. Same as the Sino-Hydro, when the government for some reason decided to classify it as barter trade. Mm -hmm. And I wonder that in this modern day, we still have a barter trade and you will use it to bypass the fiscal accounting mechanism. For some strange reason, government insisted. But I had said that if you are to factor in ESLA bond, the Archer bond, um, obviously the Sino Hydro, Sino -Hydro. and that of um, uh, Road Fund, our public debt to GDP as at end 2021 was 81%. Okay. And this is not secret. I've debated it on the floor of parliament. I've written articles to support the position of the minority. We wrote even to the IMF to get them to do what is right when Ghana was in a program. And yet the government decided to ignore us. So I'm not surprised at this report. If you ask yourself, uh, how did we get here? For me, reading the World Bank document, they have not said something new. Okay. They have said something that all this, all this time we are all aware of. But unfortunately, Ghanaians are not listening to us. The minority in parliament has raised this issue constantly, constantly. We have been very, very consistent on this matter. For some strange reason, we, the, uh, the, the, the country has not woken up to the fact that that is where we are going. Let me put it this way. If you go to the central bank website, as of June, they will say that the public debt to GDP is about 70 something percent. But you see, that is misleading. That is complete misleading for a number of reasons. How? Number one, the debt stock itself, stock itself, excludes a number of debt. An example is that the central bank itself has lent to government and classified it as overdraft, mm. yet it is not part of the debt stock in question. Okay. So the 22 billion that the central bank has given to the government excludes it's not in the debt stock, so you have to add it back. If you have to add ESLA, Sino Hydro, 
and Dutch bond and road fund, the amount in question is far more than what they have quoted as the nominal debt number. Okay. Then again, the issue of expressing this as a percentage of GDP. You know what they do all, all this time? You see, when you are comparing, you compare like with like. Mm -hmm. You have projected GDP for end year 2022. Mm -hmm. And you have the actual debt. So you have actual debt as of June, and you are using it to compare a projected GDP for December. Okay. So the denominator is bigger. It's overstated. So okay. What you should have done is that they should have compared it to projected GDP for the same period of June. Mm -hmm. So the number... It's misaligned. Okay. And that thing there is misleading and have consistently raised an issue with it. I had calculated, and I, rec I recall two weeks ago, I had come out to say that Ghana's public debt as a percentage to our GDP by end year is, is somewhere around 100%. Okay. I said this because per my own model, I have added all of this hidden debt. The debt that they have put under lock and key in a cupboard and some of them under a sofa. <laughs> I brought all of them out and added them to the public debt and I had about 100%. Okay. So I'm not surprised that the World Bank is coming out with this. Maybe because it's World Bank people are listening more. Mm -hmm. We have been saying this thing all along. And that is why today I can boldly say that from the numbers I have seen and by calculating Ghana's ability to pay, mm. our debt is simply unsustainable. Nothing more, nothing less. Mm. We can talk about it, but in the end, we'll come back to the same thing and say that our debt is simply unsustainable. You can use any model. It's not sustainable. So, so this 104% this, uh, projection, what right. could really cause this drastic change? Oh, oh, okay, so basically a couple of points. The hidden debt is now coming out. So okay. things under the carpet and under the sofa and all of that is now coming out. That's one. Mm -hmm. And then two, the city depreciation. Obviously, the foreign debt, if you express it as a percentage, uh, if, if you convert it into local currency and if the city depreciate, it's going to move up. And government attitude. Okay. Government attitude. When revenues are not coming, instead of you cutting expenditure, they go to the central bank and get them to print for them and increase the public debt. Today, they are failing to add to it. But you see, there's a limit to what you can do. By the end of the year, you have to securitize it. And if you securitize it by the end of the year, it can't hide. It will add to the public debt. Mm. And it will certainly become unsustainable. Okay. So you can hide to me. But of course, when the IMF come or the World Bank is doing analysis and they ask you the question, at that point you can't hide it because okay. you have to bring it out. Mm -hmm. So what the World Bank and the IMF have done is that they've swept under the pocket, they brought all the debt under the sofa and what they have put in their armpit and all of it, they brought everything out and we are getting 104%. Mm -hmm. So you see, if we had stopped them from hiding the public debt, we would have known that our debt is unsustainable. Pressure would have been mounted on them and decisions would have been taken to bring it back to sustainability. Mm -hmm. But because all of us sat, even though the minority was raising concerns, everybody felt that we were doing politics. But you see, the situation has passed politics. We need to secure our country. Yeah. We have to do whatever it takes to get the people in office to start acting. The situation is terrible. In fact, terrible is an understatement. The situation is sorry. Mm. Ghana's situation calls for all of us to take decisions that will preserve the future of our country. We are not in good position at all. Debt has become a major national concern. We should address it holistically, look at what is actually driving the debt. We all know what can we do to change our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. We are living a champagne life on an appetition budget. You see, we, 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 we are living above our means. Okay. How do we do that? Because right. of our attitude. So, it must stop. Pro Professor Eric Sibe, um, I indicated earlier, and, and um, Acho also corroborated to that, that on the Bank of Ghana's website, if you log on to the Bank of Ghana's website right now, you would see projections from January just to June, which is the first half of the year and which gives you 78% of GDP ratio. Now, it also gives you a total debt of 393.4 billion. Looking at this projection, is it a reasonable projection? Well, um, it could be yes, it could be no, depending on uh, where one is coming from.
I mean, why? Uh, All right, so. Uh, the central bank is Okay, so we seem to be having a terrible connection with uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Eric Sibe. That bring direct uh, costs or direct services costs uh, to government, uh, where government has to stay on yearly basis. Uh, Hello? Prof, you're on PM Express. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, Prof, I can hear you loudly. Let's try and fix Professor Eric Isibay's... Let's try and fix this line. Uh, there's a connection problem there. Let me bring in Dr. Thierry Champon, is a political risk analyst. A doc, to those who say it's an alarmist projection, what's the reality on the ground? Uh, I, I don't think it is an alarmist projection. Um, like... Um, uh, Kesel said, uh, for anyone who's been paying close attention to the numbers um, and looking at the trajectory of where our debt has been going um, in recent years, um, you could actually almost get to the point of getting between 95 and 100 percent debt to GDP. The thing, though, is that you have to look at how um, it's treated within the different sort of accounting uh, identities. So typically what we have uh, sometimes done is that when we're computing the, uh, the total public debt, of course we add the external and the domestic, but we don't fully account for the debt that is owed by the state-owned enterprises and some of the off-balance sheet transactions and things like that. And that had actually been a major issue that the IMF had flagged in some of our programs that we've engaged in, including in the last one that you know we, we just exited. And we even had a challenge with this above the line and below the line uh, reporting. So if you look at what the World Bank does, um, and on page 35 of that report, the, the state, and I'd like to quote this one here, that the debt is expected to jump in Ghana to 104.6% of GDP from 76.6% a year earlier. And they give three reasons for this. One, they say that there's going to be a widening government deficit. Um, number two, the massive weakening of the, of the city. We're talking in excess of 40% depreciation year to date. And then number three, rising debt servicing cost uh, as what is driving these numbers. And I would like to sort of pick the, the first one on the government deficit. Um, the finance minister went to parliament a few months ago with the media budget. The government said they were going to be doing 7 point something percent uh, deficit by the end of the year. But as of half year, we had already done in excess of six, right? That then leaves you a gap of about 1.5 or 1 percent thereabouts and what that then means really is that you have to do major cuts to your expenditure in order to be able to meet that uh, original 7.6 percent but as we speak currently if you look at the fiscal projections and the numbers coming through we are you know way above or beyond those uh, numbers that have been uh, brought uh, or uh, raised by the finance minister uh, a few months uh, ago. So I don't think it's an alarmist projection. In fact, in any case, we do have the IMF in town now, which is doing the debt sustainability analysis, and that's going to feed into the, um, the program design. And I would be, or I wouldn't be surprised if in the final DSA that the IMF does, we would end up with a similar debt, you know, uh, stock and debt to GDP uh, numbers because they would include a number of the things that typically would not include um, in our uh, debt accounting treatment, including those off-balance sheet transactions and then the exposure at the, um, uh, the exposure on the um, uh, state-owned enterprises.
side of things. And just a quick point here before maybe I, I hand over. The IMF would only lend if they are sure that a country's debt is sustainable. And they have a statement on their website, which I'd like to quote here again. And it says that, quote, for those countries that have unsustainable debt, the IMF is precluded from lending unless the member takes steps to restore debt sustainability, which includes debt restructuring. And to determine whether your debt is sustainable or not, there are four bands that they typically would do in the DSA analysis. You're either classified as being low risk, moderate risk, high risk, or in debt distress. And as of last year, when that uh, DSA was done in July, we were already classified as being at high risk of both external and overall debt distress. So given where we are now that with the extra right. deficit and the extra spending, I personally won't be surprised if we move up into the next category of already being in debt distress, which then means that we would have to fundamentally commence a debt restructuring exercise before accessing the IMF financing. Mm. Um, thankfully, Professor Eric Esibe is back on the line. Prof, you were earlier explaining why you may see it as a reasonable projection or not, depending on where you're coming from. Yes, I think um, that's exactly what uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Theo Champon, has mentioned. Uh, depending how you want to look at the uh, various uh, debt components, uh, if uh, you are seeing it as one that brings direct burden on government in terms of servicing, or the one that already has some streams of uh, revenue inflows that is self-financing, and the one that is deferred, I mean, in terms of its repayments. And, but when it comes to the IMF or the World Bank, they have a wider uh, debt coverage in, uh, by way of uh, the debt sustainability um, a framework that they use. And so if you look at the, the World Bank uh, framework, they will normally would cover the entire public uh, debts, uh, both guaranteed and not guaranteed debt. Uh, that will usually would include the non-guarantee uh, state-owned enterprise debt uh, will be part of it. Um, the local government debt, if there are any, obviously they will want to keep that as part of it. And then also if there are any even non-concessional debts uh, like the Sino Hydro uh, facility, as uh, uh, Honorable mentioned, obviously they will capture it since there is, comes with some kind of obligation, but all, government may not capture it because government may not see it as immediate obligation uh, to repay since the repayment is actually is in the future. It is a loan that is backed by collateral of future bauxite and sometimes processed uh, aluminum um, on exports and what have you. So the burden may not be immediate, so government may not uh, capture it, but the IMF or the World Bank uh, debt sustainability analysis will take that since it's an obligation that has to be paid, whether now or in the future. Um, the issue of um, the financial sector cleanup costs uh, or the the materialization of the contingent liabilities uh, in the energy sector, uh, that a legacy debt, which in the past or presently the government may not capture directly, the IMF DSA will definitely capture that cost, uh, which the financial sector cleanup that is adding about 4.6% of GDP uh, thereabout, and the energy costs adding about 1.5 or so. All of that will be added uh, to your debt uh, stock, uh, as the case may be. And then the debt sustainability analysis will also often will take into account uh, scenarios pertaining to your GDP, uh, what your GDP is likely to be like, uh, the, the projected GDP based on shocks, uh, based on what is happening in the economy, uh, based on your financial situation, the primary balance, your exports, uh, volatility, the commodity prices, they'll take all that into consideration. And also your exchange rates. How is your exchange rates uh, going to be 
uh, whether it's going to depreciate further, which imposes extra burden on you, and a host of other factors that uh, the government may necessarily will not consider. So putting all that together, then uh, you can be sure that your debts to GDP um, will go much higher than what the official figures will be. And that has always been the case uh, from the time memorial that we started going to the IMF. The IMF DSA will always give you a bigger uh, debt obligation than what the official figures uh, will say. Mm. Well, one of the things that the ordinary Ghanaian will be looking out for is how this whole thing will affect uh, him or will affect his pocket. Um, Dr. Thieu Champo, earlier you indicated that this is not fiction. It's actually a reality. I'll come to you to explain to me what this, uh, I mean, the effects this will have on the ordinary Ghanaian. But of course, why? Um, government has explained to us that COVID has come in to hit us. Uh, we have Ukraine. There are other issues that have affected the economy. So what if we get there? <laughs> uh, Aisha, first, any time I hear... Is and Aisha, are you asking me? Should I respond? No, this is to Axel, uh, Prof. Okay, all right. Great. Uh, Aisha, uh, any time I hear things like uh, COVID, Ukraine, it, it, it sounds like music in my ears. Is because, it? Look, COVID never affected only Ghana. Okay, Ghana obviously isn't an island. We, we have our neighboring countries. How could COVID skip Ivory Coast, Togo, Nigeria, and everybody and hit Ghana? Why is it that the Ukraine war is not affecting our neighboring countries, but it's only affecting Ghana? There's some, something fundamentally wrong with our Ghanaian economy. Let me make a point. If the government had decided to correct the attitude of hiding public debt wouldn't have gotten to where we are getting to. If the government had stopped their attitude of always creating SPVs for the purposes of hiding public debt, even though it is the central government that is actually having the obligation of servicing those debt, mm. certainly wouldn't have gotten to where we are. Okay. Aisha, one important point we need to understand is that there's difference between the debt stock itself and the debt sustainability analysis. Okay. While the debt stock talks about the stock of debt, the actual debt you owe, the DSA deals with going forward, including policies that you will implement in the medium term, mm -hmm. including some signings of loans that you are yet to draw down. So the two are different. It is a fact that the Sino Hydro is a public debt. They decided to exclude it. Today, Ghana's debt, Sino Hydro, Ghana's debt to obligation to Sino Hydro is due next year, June. Where's the bauxite? Where is the bauxite? How are we going to pay for that debt? Remember, the bauxite revenues are actually part of the tax revenue. Mm -hmm. So if you are using bauxite revenue to service a debt, it is part of the central government obligation. And the constitution is clear on this matter. If you draw from the consolidated fund for the purposes of paying a debt, it becomes a public debt and it should be captured as such. It is government attitude that has gotten us there. No government in the last few, uh, I mean, uh, since, this 19, uh, since 1992, this republic, has decided to hide debt in the magnitude that we are seeing now. Mm. It has become the stock in trade of this administration. Let's call them out. If they have erred, let's call them out and make sure they don't repeat it. This attitude of trying to say that, yes, because that is what is happening and always uh, this is going to happen, trying to rationalize, it, will not help us. Where we are, let's confront the problem as it is and deal with it in the manner that we will not repeat it as a republic. Because I am worried because clearly I don't know the model the IMF will use. But the model that I have used as an ordinary person in legislature who has some experience in the work that we do, Ghana's debt, toss it, roast it, put it in an oven, head it, maybe do whatever you want to do with it, is simply unsustainable. Mm. That is a fact. So they can do all sort of analysis, looking forward, do some whatever analysis they have to do, but I can assure you that in the end, we'll come back to the table that Ghana's debt is unsustainable. Mm. Then that comes to the question. 
that will mean we will need to do something. Okay. Something before we get an IMF program. You agree with me that Ghana need IMF program as early as yesterday. Yeah. In fact, we needed it yesterday. They have delayed in getting a program to bring the stability that we all want. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the debt has become an albatross on the neck of the Republic of Ghana. Our debt has become an overhang. Ghana's debt situation is a distress. I call it sovereign insolvency stress. Ghana, as we speak, is going through what I call sovereign insolvency stress. We are simply insolvent. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is to take a decision to restructure. But the question is, what kind of restructuring? Mm. That is the kind of conversation I believe we have to go in. We'll come we have to, to the, rest the kind of restructure that we will do that will safeguard the economy and preserve us going forward. I believe that is where we've got it. It's something that we will look at whether restructuring is on the table. And I know today you met the IMF team. What really transpired and what is their stance after this projection? But let me come to Professor Eric Sibe once more. Does this have um, the likelihood of affecting our negotiation with the IMF? Well, absolutely. Uh, it will, uh, in a sense that once uh, new figures are coming out, um, as was said earlier on, for an IMF program, you always will look at your debt stock and how sustainable that is uh, before they advance any or they enter into any agreement with you. Uh, so once uh, what is actually holding on to the agreeing on any numbers is uh, because of this VSA that is still not out yet. But once that is out and the numbers are clear, whatever agreement that they will enter into will be informed by that, right? And so they already have factored that into the analysis that uh, they will not reach any agreement yet until the DSA is out and the numbers are clear, uh, that would inform uh, how government is going to respond, uh, what is the measures government going to take to make sure that the debt levels are sustainable uh, before any uh, program will be entered into at the end of the day. So it may not necessarily prolong it, but it will help to facilitate uh, the process, uh, in my view. Once the numbers are out and uh, they are clear on the numbers, then it will be hopes on government to come out with a plan, a program as to how it intends to um, uh, ensure that the debt levels are sustainable in a way that will not uh, compromise the stability of the, of the economy and also uh, limit government's ability to uh, provide social and developmental needs uh, for the country. So. Uh, once that these numbers are out, I'm not sure whether this number is coming directly from the DSA. I'm not quite sure about that. But if it is, then of course it's going to help uh, the negotiation team to reach uh, some kind of settlement or agreement uh, early enough uh, for the country. Mm. Having met the IMF team today, um, how would you assess our negotiations so far? Uh, I think. Um Yes, we met with them this afternoon. They indicated to us that um, they are coming to the end of this mission. They've been here for almost two weeks, and um, I'm sure tomorrow they will address the press before they leave. Mm. And clearly, um, they have not arrived at a conclusion yet, because it's only two weeks. And um, the first thing they needed to do is to conclude the debt sustainability analysis. So I asked the question as to whether they have concluded what they said to us is that they are yet to conclude the debt sustainability analysis okay. for a simple reason that the DSA, you would need more than just the abstract numbers, the stock of debt. Mm. You need policy, at least in the medium term. Yeah. The medium term policy is what they are discussing with government. For example, they will need a policy such as the contracting of loans. So if there's a limit, on the contracting of loans, say $500 million, then that is what they have to input it per annum mm -hmm. over the next three years. Yep. Then if, for instance, they are going to say you are going to do a fiscal deficit over 2% or 3% or whatever, if it's 10%, you have to input its impact in the DSA. Okay. So until they get some understanding of the policies from government or based on the agreement, 
on the, at the high level what they have to do, it will be difficult for them to conclude the DSA. Mm. They went further to say that they hope that the next visit where the Ministry of Finance and Government Negotiation team will visit them at the fund, mm. they will be able to maybe finish the DSA. Okay. But I can say that they have largely an idea what the DSA situation is. Mm. The only thing is that you recall that IMF is a diplomatic institution. The last thing they will do is to be the one to cause the panic. So they will massage the situation and speak to you as it is. I recognize that. And it's important we are all appreciate it. That is their job. And they are good at doing that. So I give them that opportunity uh, to do what they have to do. But my question is, as a country ourselves, without waiting for the IMF to give us a verdict that we all know, as I said, toss it, do whatever you want to do with it, our debt is unsustainable. We need to have a national discussion on how to make our debt sustainable. Because the first thing is, after identifying that the debt is unsustainable, how do you make it sustainable before you get an IMF program? You need to agree on the debt relief that you require. If you need 20%, 30%, 40% of your GDP in a form of debt relief, mm. that brings the question is, who will bear that burden? How are you going to bear the share? Are you going to tackle external, domestic, or everybody else? Mm. Are you going to add official, bilateral, or not? At that point, you need to make a decision. And will debt restructuring alone do the trick? Because remember, debt restructuring deals only with commercial debt holders. So if you are going to deal with official bilateral and export credit agency, mm -hmm. you need more than debt restructuring. Okay. You will need what we call debt service suspension initiative under the common fr framework. Mm -hmm. So that will mean you will need a double do. Okay. A double do. So the situation is not as simple as we think it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm urging the government to start talking to the right people. People in academia. We have excellent people out there. In this country, we are blessed with people with knowledge. The academia is big. You can tap into their knowledge. Civil society and even the political divide, across the political divide and pick knowledge. Let's sit down and confront the situation at the national level. Unfortunately, they are dealing with it at the partisan level and political party level. That isn't helpful. Mm. The situation goes beyond politics. Mm. We need to rescue our country because this is all what we have and the situation is getting bad by the day. Mm. Aisha, I, I am worried. Let me be honest with you, because what I see coming, the train that I see coming is scary. We need to confront it. We can't sit on concern, allow one government to believe that I'm the one ruling, and so for that matter, we should allow whatever to happen to happen to this country. No, mm -hmm. we need to confront it as such. So fundamentally, um, I mean, one, the, there's one, one group of people or a group of people who will be at the center of this whole uh, projection and all the of issues course, that, that we are talking job. about. That is the ordinary Ghanaian. Dr. Tio Champo, what's the effect of this projection on the ordinary Ghanaian? I mean, I think we're already seeing some of the effects of the, uh, of the liquidity squeeze that we're seeing and also uh, more or less the ineffectiveness of even the central banks, you know, policy rate hikes in um, in controlling um, if inflation, right, uh, in the country. Um, and by and large, you see cost of living having gone up, you know, uh, through the roof. And, and by the way, this 104%, 105% projection we're seeing um, in comparative terms would be the biggest number we've seen since 2001 when we actually entered the HIPIC program. So, in a space of about 20 years, and with the uh, multilateral debt relief that we, really, we received, we would have almost gone back to HIPIC, right, debt levels um, if these projections uh, are to be believed and, and to come back. But importantly, the, the effect and the point that um, the Honorable makes really is if the DSA that is done by the um, IMF, and remember that the IMF and the World Bank actually use a similar framework in doing their debt sustainability um, uh, analysis. And this is widely publicly available. So if the DSA comes to a conclusion that our debt is unsustainable and is already in some form of distress, um, then 
clearly you have to re restructure the debt. And the question is, where does that burden really fall uh, in that regard? And I have actually argued that if we attempt to only do domestic debt restructuring, that could really, for me, compromise the, um, uh, the, the viability of the financial sector in the country. So we know that the commercial banks in the country hold about roughly about 55 billion or 9.2 billion, right, which is about 30% of the, the domestic debt, right, of the country. But in terms of exposure, that's about 31% of the total banking sector assets we have as of 2021. Um, and remember, again, we spent a little over 20 billion just cleaning up, you know, these banks just a few years ago. So if you restructure this debt, either by way of haircuts or trying to extend the, the tenure duration without offering any compensating policy action, then that is going to do is going to lead to further distress within the sector. And it's going to affect the asset quality of the banks. And of course, they need to make a higher provision in terms of their impairment. So the non-performing loans would be much higher than the 14% that we, we currently uh, have. So again, let me give you one number. If let's assume that on the domestic front, we're going to do a, a 20% right, discount or haircut, then the total write-off in question here would be 20% of 55. So we're talking almost 11 billion Ghana cities. And that's about 44% of what we used in cleaning up the banking sector a few years ago. So it's more going to become like a, a cost 90 exercise uh, in, that, in that regard. And that, again, has a major impact on the financial soundness, the capital adequacy ratios of the banks. And importantly, we would see further liquidity constraints and the banks not even being able to lend to the real sector or the private sector of the uh, economy. In my view, we need to have a comprehensive debt restructuring, which would also include the uh, external debt. And we have an opportunity to actually do this under the, the G G20 uh, common framework. And just to clarify a point that Honorable made, the, the DSSI, uh, the Debt Suspension Service Initiative, actually came to an end, and that's been replaced by the G20 common framework going forward. Zambia has been able to do that um, and bring all the creditors together, commercial, multilateral, bilateral, to, to you know, agree on some uh, restructuring going forward, but in a way that the burden is shared evenly amongst all the creditors. That's where I think, subject to that DSA analysis by the IMF, we eventually probably will end up having uh, to, to go. Mm. But Professor Sibbe, um Atu agrees, and um, Dr. Theo Champon agrees that indeed, and I'm sure you also agree, that if we do not want to get to this 104%, we definitely can do something before the end of the year. What can we do locally to ensure that we do not get there? Well, I, I think the, uh, as of now, the options are quite limited. Uh, to be honest, uh, because the time is too short for any uh, policy to take effect and begin to yield results. Uh, but uh, going forward, I think that um, uh, this issue of debt unsustainability, I mean, has been with us uh, for a while now. I mean, I would say that the, the cause can be attributed to both remote causes and the immediate causes, right? The, the remote one, which is largely to do with the fundamentals of this country, the, the weakness in our economic structure, which does not help us to uh, have a, I mean, very robust productive uh, capacity to be able to generate more, to export more, to generate more tax revenue uh, for the states, uh, where it stands like uh, tax to GDP is one of the lowest in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, around 13% thereabout. Definitely, and that if you just oppose that or the fact that government expenditures are often high, 
actually to meet the uh, social and development needs of the country and also the loopholes in the public financial management system where it's, uh, uh, grafts and corruptions and fiscal indiscipline all put together. Then it means that over time, we've been accumulating these debts uh, which have now breached it. Uh, this weakness in the uh, fundamentals was aggravated right from the energy crisis that we went into, financial crisis that we went into, and this was sent by the COVID and then the uh, Ukraine war. We cannot, uh, of course, take out those ones because definitely it provides some kind of shock that if your, your, your foundation is not strong, you will not be able to stand. Mm. And, and so, um, partly this, largely for me, will be to now look beyond just uh, addressing the surface of the issue to try to obtain some kind of debt sustainable level to get the IMF program going. I think as a country, it, the, this calls for us to do a lot more um, uh, soul searching. We need to search. Uh, our souls and to see where really are we going wrong as a country and what can you do to turn the corner? Uh, because I think for far too long we've been at this point and this point is even has been worse than many of the uh, uh, previous ones that we've gone into. So largely we need to be more aggressive, particularly with domestic revenue generation uh, mm. to support our development uh, program other than over relying on uh, uh, borrowing and aid and all those kind of things would definitely will not help us. So, how do we expand and generate more revenue from uh, the domestic uh, economy? That, mm -hmm. for me, is what we be, have to begin to have a dialogue around. And this should be uh, non-partisan, as Honourable mentioned, that all of us have to put our uh, show this to the real and begin to think deeply what can we do as a nation to up our uh, tax to GDP to about 20%? That will support huge expenditure, the huge infrastructure and social needs that we have the, to support the vulnerable uh, society in terms of social safety net and social protection. Mm. That will make sure that they are also protected. Mm. I think this provides good opportunity for us to begin to do that kind of soul searching and think deeply on how to mobilize enough revenue. Otherwise, government will go, government will come, and will still be coming, having within that kind of uh, roller coaster. And, and I'm happy that the politicians are beginning to realize that this is gone beyond politics. Atu just admitted sure. to that. And I'm happy, happy. Um, Atu, how do we mitigate the effects so that we can be sustainable? Um, or is it that um, that restructuring is on the table? Mm -hmm. Aisha, the government has no choice than to restructure the debt mm. in a very comprehensive manner. Because if, for instance, it is determined that Ghana needed, for instance, 50% of, of your GDP in a form of debt relief, the burden cannot necessarily be on domestic debt holders because okay. the impact on the economy will be severe. Mm. particularly on the financial sector, which all of us don't want it to go down. This will mean that the restructuring should be comprehensive. Probably you may have to include arrests onto contractors. So that is the kind of conversation that we should all have to mitigate the situation. I call it burden share. Mm. So you share the burden evenly. Mm. So I am saying that the government must start the conversation of a possible restructuring. And then the restructure envelope must be comprehensive. No one, obviously no one, based on the numbers that I have seen, can run away from this. The government's attitude of trying to hide it from the public and trying to use PL to say that we are not there yet, meanwhile we are there, eventually we will be there. Mm -hmm. Today, Aisha, when they took office, Ghana's public debt to GDP was 55%. They've run it to 104% by the end of 2022. This means that they have increased the debt to GDP by approximately 100%. Okay. At a time that Ghana's GDP has grown. 
So obviously, it is the attitude of government borrowings that is causing this. Mm. When they took office, tax revenue as a percentage to uh, have the percentage of your tax revenue that you use for debt servicing was about 66%. Mm. Today, you need about 90% of your tax revenue to service your debt, obviously because of government attitude of overborrowing. Okay. So we need to pull the brakes. And I have said that when parliament resumes, we in the minority, we are going to make a decision. The decision is not to approve any more loan for this administration. Okay. Because it is this debt that has sunk us down and down and down and down. Mm. We don't want to stop to continue going down. The digging must stop. Mm. So that's our position. In the, in, in the interim, I mean, within, uh, from now till about November, what do you think government should do? You see, first of all, they need to seek stability. You see, when you stabilize the economy, the city will stop the depreciating okay and then it will not have impact on the foreign debt on the foreign as debt. a percentage to your gdp all right That's so one. and then number two they have to pull the brakes they have to stop the borrowing it's just too much okay. they are going overboard mm. well, well this is a conversation that has just started because look uh, the country's debt affects everybody in the country and it affects your pockets my pockets so it's a conversation that we'll be monitoring Ato has just indicated that when they go back to parliament there's a conversation that will happen on this we're also monitoring the imf negotiations all of this is a conversation that will continue till we see the head and tail of this whole thing i'm grateful for your time thank you dr casey lato for saying for coming professor eric sibi i'm grateful and dr three champon Thanks so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of our program.